Hello and welcome everybody. I think we are possibly just waiting for a few final participants to join. Um, welcome to this session, um, Health Partnerships and Solidarity During COVID-19. Uh, I'm Sarah, I'm the International Partnerships Lead at the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association and an honorary advisor with FECT. I also work in the National Health Service with the Specialist Pharmacy Service. Uh, and have over the last 18 months been particularly consumed with our domestic uh, COVID-19 vaccine response. I've seen through my work with FECT and CPA involve various partnership projects over the years how in this type of crisis the health partnership model works and is so crucial to health system strengthening. Uh, we're talking COVID-19 in this session but FECT has also responded in, with the partnership model of earthquakes, coups, floods, the list goes on. Health partnerships have demonstrated remarkable um, support and commitment to each other since the start of this pandemic. In this session, we will examine how the support provided between partners has adapted and evolved, pivoted if you like, over the last 18 months, particularly given the reduction in international travel and capacity uh, and the growing need to switch into crisis mode. Um, as you'd have seen in the briefs, we have four excellent presentations and I can't wait to hear from them. Uh, so with no further ado, I will introduce our first speakers. Uh, Grace Drury um, is presenting with, uh, with Timothy Nunn, Dr. Timothy Nunn. Grace is a researcher and a programme manager in the Department uh, of Orthopaedics at the University of Oxford. Uh, she's managed several global health partnerships, including projects developing standardised clubfoot training that's been translated in and used in over 20 countries. Uh, Timothy is the medical director and consultant orthopaedic surgeon um, at the Cure Ethiopia Children's Hospital in Addis uh, and his interest in clubfoot is long-standing. So with no further ado, uh, Grace and Timothy, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that introduction, Sarah. Uh, I hope everyone can see our slides. Um, so, yeah, very um, warm welcome to everyone. And it's a pleasure to join you and to share, as Sarah said, our lessons learned in our health partnership of how we've adapted to challenges in our project, which has focused on the management of delayed presenting clubfoot. And um, these challenges over the eight, last 18 months have um, yeah, taught us a lot and uh, we're just happy to share our experience I'll start off and then hand over to Tim to continue. So a bit of background, um, our, the main aim of our project is to increase the capacity of healthcare workers um, in the treatment um, of delayed presenting clubfoot in walking age children who are an underserved population. And our project is part of the SET Africa Mother and Child Grants Programme funded by Johnson & Johnson. And our core output is the development of a one day training course in the principles of managing delayed presenting clubfoot. Um, these are for children who weren't, for whatever reason, weren't treated um, more straightforwardly as infants. And therefore, um, what they need as walking age children um, is a bit different and includes um, a range of surgical options following um, treatment using principles of Ponseti management as well. And uh, you can see from the picture before and after of a child who's been treated and uh, if the delayed presenting club isn't treated it can result in quite a painful deformity and um, lead to a real loss of mobility and function as well and the course is going to be used in Ethiopia and also other settings where this condition is commonly seen often these are low resource settings where there's limited access to treatment services and often not enough trained health workers as well so our course will cover aspects such as assessing the deformity and planning treatment together, uh, how to correct the clubfoot deformity um, step by step, how to apply plaster casts for older children, which are the appropriate surgical options, the process of rehabilitation, and um, really promoting a multidisciplinary approach with physios and surgeons working together and involving families as well. So um, our outputs will include training manuals for the, fac me, the faculty and participants, 
uh, teaching presentations, including guided discussions, um, teaching video resources, and uh, it's been wonderful. We've been able to work with the team in Addis Ababa to create 20 teaching videos. Uh, and um, you can see a few clips from those on the slide. We've developed assessments to try and um, look at the learning outcomes of the course and also to share our findings from surveying practitioners internationally as well. Uh, so these are some of the challenges that we face, which I'm sure are familiar to, to many of us in this meeting. With the limited travel, we haven't been able to hold the face-to-face -face meetings that we hope to. And of course, the pandemic has impacted on clinical services for all our partners and uh, led to quite a lot of dramatic changes in workload and redeployment as well. Um, sadly, there has been illness and um, un at short notice times of self-isolation and um, of course personal and organisational challenges which have impacted on capacity at different points in the project and at different times as different waves have hit um, different partners um, internationally and um, through it all a lot of uncertainty about what's possible to plan and what's possible to do. So how have we adapted? Um, and I think um, the, our first point about compassion was mentioned um, in earlier in the sort of opening panel discussion actually without the opportunity for face to face we've just really tried to be intentional about support having a supportive atmosphere in our partnership and just recognizing that we're all facing massive challenges um, but we want to to do our best to support each other and be understanding um, as we continue to find new ways of working so we've looked at our timelines um, and set have been very helpful as well in thinking how can we adapt these to allow some flexibility and to what are the contingency plans that we can make um, through the project. And working online together, it's, it's something we were doing a bit already, but the pandemic has really um, helped us to develop more skills in this and to maximise what we can do together in terms of using video conferencing working to collaborate with online documents and learning the different features that we can use together, developing the teaching videos. So although these needed to be filmed in Ethiopia um, on the ground, we've been able to get the input from our international team and um, online surveys aren't new, but we really use those quite extensively to get as much input as we could from our international colleagues that would um, input to the development of the training. We have recorded our meetings um, more regularly so that where we're relying on online communication and sometimes video or audio or internet quality is not good, then at least we've captured the detail as much as possible. And um, modern dictation software has helped us on key occasions to um, be able to just have very detailed transcripts in real time um, where we've had really detailed um, input that we wanted to capture as well. Um, sometimes it's been really difficult to, to get everyone together at the same time um, and rather than postpone meetings for another month or two we took the step to sometimes hold um, asynchronous meetings say for example in one week we held um, the same meeting three times as a core team to enable uh, the maximum number of our key advisors to give their advice and input and then we consolidated those meeting minutes together um, so we've not always done that but at key times it's helped to keep the project momentum going while recognizing that um, everyone's been under a lot of pressure as well. Uh, Tim will say more about how we've used a hybrid format for our pilot training course um, and then also we've learned from other colleagues so we're not the only ones facing challenges with develop, delivering practical training without face-to-face -face opportunities and our colleagues in Global Club for Initiative have um, taken a lot of steps as well in hybrid and blended learning, whom we've learned from. And the final point here is to say that um, I think unexpectedly the shift of ownership in our project has been more towards the local team as we've relied on them to deliver uh, the project and the pilot course and the training videos. And that's actually been a really healthy thing because um, it shows more stronger ownership of the development of the and outputs and results of the project. So I'll now hand over to Tim. Hey, thank you, Grace. Um, so I just want to echo thanks to Thet really for 
the very flexible approach that they made for our course. Um, so we, we made a number of adaptions to the pilot course. It was apparent uh, three to four months before the course ran uh, that due to travel restrictions in Ethiopia um, and international problems, we, we needed to run the course without international visitors present here in Ethiopia. So our faculty relied much, much more on local surgeons, local physiotherapists, uh, rather than international visitors. And I think our local faculty were much helped having done the background survey of experts uh, before the course ran. And it really gave us confidence um, in the content of the course that we were presenting that wasn't just sort of our good ideas, but a consensus of expert opinion. Um, it was still possible for us to have national and local travel. Uh, so participants came and we changed our project plan uh, to run the pilot course twice instead of once with two, co two cohorts of physiotherapists, doctors and surgeons from Addis and the surrounding regions with about 16 delegates in each pilot. Uh, we complied fully with the Ethiopian COVID-19 directives on the meeting size, mask wearing, um, and all the patients and family members who, that were brought in for the practical sessions were screened for COVID-19 and delegates were vaccinated. As Grace mentioned, we had international team uh, joining us remotely by video conferencing. We had six faculty from the UK, Canada and India and remote Zooming delegates as well from Kenya and the Philippines. And the on the ground delegates uh, fed back to us that they really enjoyed having the international faculty on Zoom. I think I want to highlight three learning points. Um, first of all, with this kind of um, presentation style and, and format, um, we felt that having a full time IT technical help was truly essential for the course that we ran. Um, there were major help needed when internet outages happen due to generator switchovers and, 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 and everything else. And these people on hand were, were there to help us cover that. The second thing was that we felt that timekeeping had to be tighter as compared to an in-house course. And the third uh, learning point we felt was that uh, we used, as Grace was mentioning, narrated teaching videos which were created especially for the casting and surgical demonstrations. And some of these videos were deliberately silent and uh, we left it essentially open for live narrations, which our remote faculty did. Um, uh, Dr. Alaric is doing that on the top uh, right hand corner of this image. And we felt that that really worked well and engaged people uh, well on the ground here. Next slide, please. Um, in the practical sessions, um, as I said, we had children, we had 10 uh, older children with delayed presenting clubfoot uh, come in and we had five of these kids in each pilot. Uh, we practiced scoring the severity of the deformity. We applied plaster casts to them under supervision. And uh, we used a number of um, mobile phone cameras and uh, Zoom devices, and also a specialist video eye goggles which enabled the online participants to view the practicals, even though they weren't here in person. And we had quite a lot of interactive sessions and we structured it so that the inter interactive questions were led by the local faculty and the more didactic parts by the Zooming faculty. And we of course had to have backup plans for this in case, for example, we experienced the tech failure for the local faculty to essentially take over the presentations. Next slide, please. So our final reflections of the, the course itself, um, as, we, as we did two, um, two pilots, we, we didn't actually make a whole load of changes between the two pilots, uh, but we did feel that um, having really good IT equipment and support was essential if this kind of a course was to be done in other settings. So thank you very much for your attention. 
thank you so much um both to uh, Grace and to Dr. Timothy Nunn. That's an absolutely fascinating presentation. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. If anybody has any questions, please do feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and whilst we are waiting, if anybody has anything, I, I was going to ask, do you, do you think you will go, uh, to either of you, do you think you will go back to how the training was delivered pre-pandemic? Or, or do you think that, efficiency is the wrong word but do you think that the changes that you've made um will continue because they are clearly successful either of you <laughs> i think that um it's such a practical skill that um to be able to hold as much of it in person as possible is really important but we've um through creating the resources and the video materials that i think obviously a lot of learning can be done online as well. Tim, is anything you want to say? No, I, I agree fully with that. Um, I think if we were to run it again at our institution here, uh, we, we probably will, have, will repeat it much the same, if, even if there were no pandemic. Um, if it were to be done elsewhere in Ethiopia, probably um, the uh, the, 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 you know, a, a more hands-on, a more on-the-ground type approach would be best, uh, certainly to start with. Thank you. So I've got um, I've got a question from um, from Audrey uh, for Grace. Uh, you were mentioned remote collaboration uh, and enhanced local ownership. Um, how can we ensure local ownership is kept at the forefront? Once, uh, once travel resumes. And then following on from, from that, um, we had another question from Murray, um, amazing example of training and how much will future club foot surgery be done by capable national staff? So pretty much the same question. Um, I'll answer the first question, which is that uh, the amazing physiotherapy and surgeon, surgical team at Cure Ethiopia, as I think because they were the lead faculty on the ground because we were relying on them to deliver the course. Um, they're also part of the mentoring and follow up for the course participants over the next few months. Um, and so I think that will be one way to really strengthen that relationship of their confidence as teachers and mentors. Uh, Tim, do you want to answer the second question? Sorry, please remind me of the second part. Sure. Um, so just amazing training was, was the, the comment. Um, how much will the future club foot surgery be done by the capable national staff? Yeah, I, I think um, we, we, do, we do aim to, uh, to use it definitely here in Ethiopia again, uh, but it was developed more for, um, for other settings as well, not just Ethiopia. Um, so uh, w w one of our one of our prominent faculty was from India. He was very keen to see uh, a course like this run run in India, um, where the same kind of patient population exists. So um, yeah, um, I'm I'm conscious that, w that that the the success of the course won't just be national; it, it will will be an international uh, stage as well. Thank you. Perfect. I think we've possibly got time just for one last question. So this is from Agnes um, to uh, Dr. Nunn. Something we found with the Royal College of Psychiatry projects in sub-Saharan Africa is that our doctors find it difficult to ask for cross cover to attend training events. Um, is this something you needed to tackle? Um, yeah, no, that, that there are many challenges um, with, with training events. Um, uh, and I, th I think particularly with a multidisciplinary team approach like we did, um, it does require buy-in from people who are not just the doctors, but uh, supervisors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, th there does need to be um, uh, an in institutional um, buy-in for these sort of things. And yeah, I, I, I think these things, these things were, these kind of relationships with people around um, were, uh, were, were developed over many years and um, you know with, with people coming to our institution and requesting this teaching so that there was a lot of enthusiasm for it and um, I, th I think the success of getting those delegates that we did was was probably down to more local reasons than 
than anything else. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, if there are any further questions, we will we we can forward them on to you to answer um, at the end. Uh, so. Um, thank you very much to both those presenters. Uh, we will now move on to our second presentation. Uh, Sophie Foote, uh, delighted to have join us. She's a GP ST3 Fellow with the Seven Deanery at Health, Imp Health Improvement England, Improving Global Health Fellowship Scheme, um, based in Bristol with the RC. Uh, GP. Uh, and amongst other things, she's a public health scholar at Bristol City Council and with the Sexual and Reproductive Health Division and a junior international lead uh, on the Seven Global Health Society. Uh, absolutely delighted to have you with us. Sophie, over to you. Thank you. I'll just bring up my slides now. Um, here we go. So thank you for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, yes, I was the Improving Global Health Fellow um, through HEE from February to uh, August this year. And I worked with the RCGP and my GP Society to evaluate their quality improvement training programme for GPs and uh, look into their response to COVID-19. So what I'll cover is sort of the background of the partnership and how it was all established, uh, how it was evaluated and particularly focusing on the changes in response to COVID and the Myanmar coup, which has made things a lot more difficult. And then the conclusions and recommendations following on from that. So uh, back in 2017, the Myanmar Minister of Health tasked the Myanmar GP Society and RCGP to develop a strategy um, for improving quality, for quality improvement in general practice. So there was a pilot project at this time, which was um, aided by another HE IGH fellow. Um, and they found that actually the key areas that were needed were infection control, um, education, med improvement of medical records, general CPD uh, and quality improvement principles. So things like audit, significant event analysis. Um, and then we were lucky enough in 2018 to get some funding from the Department for International Development through SET, um, which so we could um, provide QI training to GPs across uh, 64 practices in two regions. Um, during that time, this was all face to face. So there were four visits, so quarterly visits by about six RCGP trainers um, each time. And then each visit, they did three face to face half day work workshops. Um, they also did 46 practice visits uh, and what they did was assess the quality markers and um, made sort of a practice development plan and then went back later to see how they were getting on with that. Um, and they were lucky that six of the Myanmar GPs uh, attended the UK on an exchange visit as well. Uh, in 2020, the plan had been for the uh, the project to sort of expand to new areas uh, and a curriculum was created so we could have a more um, regimental rat ratified sort of um, uh, curriculum for us to follow and also the plan was to expand to do a quality champion program which we were still able to do however with a different slant due to Covid so rapidly some changes were made in that it was a uh, transition to remote these sessions were half day still, but they were very much small group webinars, about nine to 13, 14 Myanmar GPs. And each webinar or session had uh, three RCGP trainers. We ensured that one of those trainers was uh, Myanmar diaspora, so Burmese speaking. And um, sometimes the quality champions that were trained, also one of them would come in to help with translation and facilitation. Um, now, in total, 30 GPs were trained in the basic QI principles and 35 in as quality champions. And what these are is people who've GPs who've already completed the basic training in 2018. And this focused more on facilitation skills and train the trainer and feedback so that there can be potentially more sustainability going forwards and they can lead it more in future. Inevitably, there was a real need for education on COVID and infection control. So there were more broad reaching webinars on COVID and infection control provided as well. And sadly, in um, 
in February 2021, as Emma mentioned yesterday, there was the Ryan Marku. Um, this had a huge impact on health workers. So not only were health workers being um, uh, targeted and were very vulnerable, um, that meant that we had to have a little bit of uh, cautious contact with um, any of them in country. Um, and also clinics, medical clinics were being closed um, by the military and therefore they had to change tact and a lot of focus was on emergency clinics, which, which impacted upon the, the work that we did. With regards to, oh, I skipped a slide. Um, so the way I evaluated the programme was a uh, mixed method, thematic analysis. So focused on some quantitative data, and I'll go through that on the next slide with the graphs, and some qualitative data. So had six semi-structured interviews with trainers and um, trainee written feedback following the course as well. So with regards to the quantitative data, so before and after each training session, the trainees with Myanmar GPs were asked to rate their confidence in certain areas. So um, the left slides just show some of the areas that we covered in the basic programme, things like case reviews uh, and significant event analysis. And then the right um, graphs just show some of the QI champion um, topics as well, which included motivational interviewing and uh, equality and diversity. And the average ratings of confidence increased from 2.3 to 4.4. Uh, um, and then, sorry, this slide where it's gone onto uh, sh screen share isn't coming up quite as expected, but I'll talk through it anyway. So the um, general results were that actually the, the most favoured and most um, successful initiatives were the quality circles and peer discussions. Um, and uh, I'll talk through some of the quotes below, which explain some of the significance of these in the coup and the response to COVID, but also things like chronic disease management was very favoured and there a lot of the trainees set up um, chronic disease registered registers and recall clinics. Um, and then onto the medical records, there was discussion over whether some of them may bring in uh, electronic medical records. With regards to some of the quotes, these were quotes from trainers and um, the initial one was sort of talking about their rapid response to teaching. So things like we discussed sharp boxes one day and then by the next day these have been ordered and the trainees have printed off posters for infection, infection control and put them up around. So things happen quickly. Um, and uh, another quote which was stuck in my mind was there was a um, a few trainers that sort of changed their whole approach to practice. So they were empowered from the session to make changes and it very much opened doors for them. But I think the main thing as discussed was these quality circles. So what they are is it's the trainees are encouraged to come together in small groups outside of the teaching to discuss cases, but also for support for each other, because in Myanmar, GPs often work in isolation. And so it's easy for quality to drop off and for people, the trainees not to, or the GPs not to understand how other people are practicing. And this proved vital for the coup and for the response to COVID-19. So um, it was found that actually some of the um, units which organised themselves for emergency clinics and emergency services during the coup were loosely based upon the quality circles that they had um, come together on. Um, and it really proved to become quite a strong bond for them and uh, an opportunity to support each other during these, these dramatic changes. With regards to the specific transition to remote during COVID, so there are obvious benefits in the sense that it's far more accessible for the GPs in Myanmar to log on to the computer from wherever they are geographically. And it meant that we could expand to new areas because previously some GPs had been travelling three, four hours on poor road infrastructure to come in to the face-to-face -face sessions. And uh, not only was this time consuming and therefore they couldn't work in practice for this and lost money by, by the nature of that, um, but also it meant that sometimes there was less attendance comparative to the remote sessions. 
It also meant that with regards to the RCGP trainers, the British trainers, it was a lot less demand on them from time in the sense of not having to go out there and being able to do it working around their own practice in the UK. And it meant that we could increase the frequency of the sessions to monthly and provide more of a mentoring approach rather than a quarterly um, sessions face to face. And it was cheaper because obviously we didn't have to pay for trainers to go out there and it saved money for the trainees in country. However, understandably, it wasn't the same as face to face. Uh, one of the limitations was language. Um, so a lot of the, the Myanmar GPs found that actually it was harder to understand the English language when we were teaching on Zoom compared to face to face, whether that is speed of presenting um, or articulation, I'm unsure. But what we actually did was rapidly change in light of the feedback. So we ended up doing a lot of breakout rooms that were facilitated by Burmese speakers. And we found that a lot of them wanted to speak in Burmese in the breakout rooms. And then they'd come back to the central room and we could discuss things in English at that point. Um, I'd like to point out they are taught uh, medicine often in English, so um, they do have a good understanding, but feel more comfortable speaking in Burmese. The other thing which can be difficult, and this is shown in the in uh, research as well, is gaining rapport from you know solely online sessions is harder. That being said, we found the breakout rooms and small groups made that a lot hard, a lot easier. Um, but a lot of the trainers from the UK that had never been to Myanmar find it harder to understand the culture when not having those informal chats before and after. Um, and internet connectivity was an issue, but I'm not quite sure how we can get around that. Um, but that certainly, you know, was prevalent quite a lot. Um, very relevant to the whole that conference really, but definitely it shows from the previous slides with quotes, you know, the trainee resilience from having these sessions and having these contacts was shown to be huge. And actually for the trainers, showing that during the pandemic they had, you know, something to focus their mind on and, and something outside of NHS practice was really shown to be helpful. And it certainly helped me doing it alongside my general practice. And subsequent to this, during the military coup, like I said, we haven't been able to do the sessions like we did before. We've more provided an informal support and partnered with Theft and Paediatric Societies Internationally and various different agencies to expand uh, to cover advocacy, communications, education, fundraising. Um, and we organised uh, a cycle ride from London uh, that equated to the distance from London to Myanmar via, via the UNF embassy and then back to the UK to raise money for a couple of clinics out in Myanmar. Um, as for the sort of last conclusions and recommendations, so the main things that came out of it which are transferable to other agencies are, or other um, initiatives are the use of quality circles and peer support and that actually that uh, goes on from just the, the sessions that are provided and it's shown that people continue that afterwards also the use of quality champions so uh, to sort of create sustainability and continue the teaching from there and create ownership in country and actually that when you're presenting remotely group discussions and role play are um you know a requirement really and doing the small group sessions looking forwards and this was just broached in the last session actually but what will we what's possible going forward to sort of as a hybrid model and there's quite a lot of uh, research on whether a blended program is an option which is basically where you would go out and do a couple of days face to face to build the rapport to make the contacts initially and then have regular monthly or quarterly webinars and remote sessions after that to follow up um, and the use of uh, at the present, we don't have a formally learning platform. We just have Dropbox. Um, so the creation of an e-learning platform and maybe even an e-portfolio. This is obviously all based upon uh, ability to travel and improvements from the coup. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you so much, Sophie. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we have one question in the box from uh, Audrey. Uh, Sophie, what more... Uh, the UK partnerships can do to promote solidar solidarity with healthcare workers in Myanmar at, at this time? What else can we do? And I think that's a big question. <laughs> I think I, 
it's really hard. So there's been lots of things that have been going on on the ground, anything from creating learning resources for them on trauma and um, so that they can sort of, they're really keen to self-teach things that will be helpful during the coup with all this this um, different uh, healthcare that they're encountering. You know, GPs previously would be seeing things we'd be seeing, would be seeing chronic diseases, but now they're having to manage very different presentations. So a lot of sort of separate societies have been setting up uh, platforms and webinars for that. Um, the other thing is is generally just maintaining it in the media and maintaining an awareness of the coup so that it's not forgotten and so that international agencies still are keeping a presence and um you know trying to make change but i think it's there's no quick fix so there are actually and um, set have organized um led by ben uh, which i think was meant to be last friday uh, fortnightly meetings between all of the agencies to try and you know uh, continue the response but I don't think there's any quick thank you no I, I don't suppose there is Sophie but I think all those all those uh, all those ideas are are going to keep it in the front of people's minds um thank you so much absolutely fascinating presentation um sorry we haven't had a bit longer for questions but again if anybody has any further questions we can forward these on to Sophie so thank you to Sophie Fit, and we will now move on to our third presentation. So absolutely delighted to welcome Joy Kemp, the Global Professional Advisor at the Royal College of Midwives, uh, who will be co-presenting uh, with San Sangeeta Saha Prima. Um, Joy's been a friend of Thet for many years. I've had the pleasure of hearing her speak before on a number of partnerships. Um, but I'm particularly looking forward to hearing this presentation uh, and a case study from the UK and Bangladesh. Uh, Joy and Sangeeta, over to you both. Thank you very much. And I'm hoping uh, uh, you can see my slides. Uh, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, colleagues, wherever you are. It's great to be here today sharing about our health partnership, a twinning program between two professional midwives associations, the Bangladesh Midwifery Society and the Royal College of Midwives in the UK. Um, I'm Joy Kemp, Global Professional Advisor with the RCM, and I'm so pleased to be joined today by Sangeeta Saha Prema, a young midwife leader from Bangladesh who is the project leader for our set funded COVID-19 project. So, oh, I'm sorry, I just wasn't on the first slide. Uh, so there's now plenty of high quality evidence that uh, when we shed our references at the end of the slides, that to achieve the sustainable development goals, um, investment in midwives is paramount. And the recent State of the World's Midwifery Report 2021 shows a global shortage of almost one million midwives. Twinning between midwives associations can promote solidarity, can raise the profile of the profession and provide a stronger platform for advocacy. Twinning is a special type of health partnership with an explicit emphasis on reciprocity and research on the critical success factors for midwifery twinning highlights the importance of power sharing and equity, and specifically partnership between professional associations of female dominated professions, such as midwifery, can engender women's empowerment and leadership development. So BMS and the RCM have been twinned since 2017 for mutual strengthening and reciprocal learning. And the partnership is supported by UNFPA Bangladesh and was shortlisted for the Times Higher Education Awards at 2020 International Collaboration of the Year. So looking briefly at the different country contexts of our two associations. In Bangladesh, midwifery is a new cadre comprised, in, comprised entirely of young women. There's an exceptional policy level support from the government of Bangladesh with a pledge from the Honourable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to support education and deployment of midwives. 
The first midwives were deployed in 2018 to rural health centres known as Upazilla Health Complexes. And now approximately 2,000 midwives are deployed mostly in health centres, but some in hospitals. And there are also midwives working with NGOs, especially in humanitarian settings, in Rohingya refugee camps, and some in the private sector. And a few midwives are now moving into education, and there are two now at policy level in the Directorate General of Nursing and Midwifery at the Ministry of Health. There's ongoing need for advocacy to create a demand in the population for midwifery services and to create the professional space for midwives to provide those services and to perform to their full scope of practice. BMS itself was started in 2010 by nurses, by nurse teachers, but young midwives are now stepping into the leadership of the association. In the UK, um, almost uh, we midwifery is uh, more established with regulation since 1902 and the RCM itself being founded in 1881. Almost 1% of the UK, UK population has Bangladeshi heritage and recent reports have shown that Asian women are twice more likely than white women to die from pregnancy complications. 2.8% of NHS staff are South Asian but South Asians are underrepresented in the midwifery and nursing workforce. And we know that black and brown midwives in the NHS face more bullying and disciplinary processes, are less likely to advance in their careers or to become leaders. So we have many lessons, reciprocal lessons to learn from our, our partners in Bangladesh. Very briefly, our intervention in the partnership is to twin UK midwife volunteers with young midwife leaders in Bangladesh. The numbers are small. We currently have seven volunteers engaged long-term uh, with around 25 young midwife leaders. It is also a twinning of our two organizations with RCM and BMS staff and officers working very deeply together with daily contact. Within the partnership, there are two funded projects, one, with UNFPA for organisational development and advocacy, and a small FET COVID-19 response grant that Sangeeta will talk about in a moment. We have work streams on organisational development, advocacy, leadership, education, communication and networks, quality improvement and audit, and service user engagement. And it's currently a virtual partnership. We've harnessed several innovations in responding to COVID-19 and they're burgeoning new partnerships with the women's development sector. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Sangeeta, uh, who will talk about uh, solidarity during COVID-19. Over to you, Sangeeta. Thank you, ma'am. So maybe can you hear me, all of you? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. So hi, everyone. And good morning. Uh, so my presentation is I'm sharing the solidarity during COVID-19. Next slide, please. So BMS response to COVID. So when the start, when uh, pandemic started, BMS started to collect it, record of midwives affected, whoever affected by coronavirus virus. So uh, during the COVID-19, uh, BMS collected that uh, whoever infected COVID-19 and uh, that is given to the Director General of Nursing and Midwifery and given the uh, given that those midwives the food provide uh, medicines according to their needs and because midwives are working in Rohingya refugee camps and they those are far away from their homes so uh, BMS is given the help to BMS giving the some help the midwives uh, by give, provide the medicine and according to their needs. And uh, until now, 112 midwives are affected in during COVID-19. And that that is, and during the pandemic started, BMS distributed three layer cloth masks, face shield, gloves, sanitizers to 240 Upojila Health Complex, where midwives are working and perform their duties. So 
when uh, we are uh, BMS thinking that they are giving the uh, mass to the midwife, BMS taking the initiatives to give in this order to women disabled organization uh, uh, that we can make more uh, develop our new partnership women sectors and uh, are raising our profile to uh, the women sector and wider stakeholders. Uh, so and midwives uh, can effect, um, decrease affected from the uh, COVID-19. And we have our helpline systems, uh, 24 by 7, we have our helpline systems as uh, so that any midwives can, any part of the corner can uh, help call anytime and uh, if she need any help from the BMS Bangladesh Midwife Free Society, she can call and uh, one of our midwives, uh, Nam Karima Akhtar, she's maintained this helpline number and uh, she's reported monthly that those who ever have problem and we are help, we are helping uh, the, those midwives uh, according to their uh, needs. And uh, uh, BMS is uh, most of the midwives during pandemic uh, needs the asked for the infrared thermometer because they wanted to differentiate the mothers uh, whoever has the uh, temperature and tries the mothers uh, whoever have the hot temperature and who have uh, the not. So they need the, the infrared thermometer before uh, giving the services before entering any person in the epidemic health complexes. So BMS given the infrared thermometer to the midwives during the pandemic and the innovations during pandemic. So now before the pandemic, we are uh, doing our meetings in the because our executive committee and our YML is decentralized over all, all the country. So uh, the pandemic is started. The pandemic has given a lots of advantages to learn new things. So we are using the Zoom and Google Meet platform for for our monthly meeting general members meeting and also as well as the executive board meeting and also i want to share as well as we are celebrating international day of the midwives in the june uh, and uh, uh, in the in, uh, in the pandemic how can we know the midwives problems and the midwives uh, whatever midwives face in this situation we have to know their problems and the situation that's why we have done the monkey survey and that, that that's how uh, we know the midwives problems and the situation and uh, we uh, bms all midwives are heroes who are working in this pandemic so bms recognized few midwives uh, for their contribution during pandemic and working in the humanitarian area so conduct the award ceremony uh, in the online and uh, our dg director general sir is uh, declaring this uh, the midwife's name and that is in that is um, con the award ceremony is conducted from by the Bangladesh Midwife Society through online, and uh, uh, we have we given uh, so much uh, uh, to the midwives. Like uh, before, uh, some midwives can do the uh, English courses and computer courses because uh, uh, they are uh, live. Uh, because we are in the capital of uh, Dhaka, so Dhaka, Dhaka has the lots of opportunity. So uh, the British Council uh, institution, English, and the most of the government IT sector is established in Dhaka. So uh, many voters wanted to do the uh, English course, but they don't want it to do because they are in decentralized in the part of the uh, world, country. So in COVID-19 period, uh, the British Council, con we BMS contacts some online training through uh, online, like uh, uh, communicate with British Council and the IT sectors. And uh, uh, by this way, uh, midwives are uh, uh, taking these courses from the uh, from online, from British Council and more, many more uh, famous organ uh, institution. Also, we have our platform before the pandemic started, we have uh, our website and uh, bms1.com. So there have been 82 course that uh, related to midwifery professional. That is uh, all about the how to uh, the NC, PNC help, how to do a manual delivery and how to do the manual removal of placenta. That is more about the professional, uh, et cetera. Et cetera. And the last one, uh, the third project update. Uh, so you know, all of you know that uh, this year, uh, 2021, we uh, May, um, month of May, we are getting the project third, the Tropical Health Education Trust. And the project will uh, end 31st October. 
and uh, we are selected five upazila health complex uh, uh, they are uh, choose five upazila health complex uh, on M uh, mr regulation family plan the family planning services and post abortion care alongside with uh, anc pnc and interpretum care and uh, we see uh, the result of this project is uh, the we are giving the equipping of five uscs on mr pack and family planning services uh, we given some instruments and uh, that is related to mr pack and family planning and increase the result too is increased community awareness about services during covid 19 we have done a lot of radio program newspaper articles and the tele television programs uh, and setting five banner into the usc for uh, community awareness and uh, result 3 is training capacity building of midwives and frontline health workers and administrators we are given the refresher training to our 27 midwives uh, that they can they, they can refresh their knowledge about uh, on mr pack and family planning and uk volunteers uh, help us to do a uh, leadership training and help the midwives to do leadership training and other mentorship training to build up their leadership and grow their confidence level yeah thank you over to you ma'am thank you yes. so much sangeeta we're running out of time so i'm i'm just going to say two things which is we didn't have time to really explore the reciprocity but we're really serious about this reciprocal learning and it's feeding into wider work the rcm is doing on race and championing equity both in our own organization and in UK maternity services and we are needing to do more joined up thinking on how this work is going to influence UK maternity outcomes um and moving forward uh, we've got to find ways of sustaining the partnership through funding uncertainties and BMS are going to hold an election in December and for the first time the association will be led by a midwife as president so i think that's a great time a great place to finish thank you very much indeed thank you so much uh, fascinating presentation i i'm hoping we've got there were some two really good questions i don't know if you could answer them really 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 quickly um the first one um is there a or is it is there other reasons why asian women could be more likely to die from complications Uh, that's probably not a question you can answer quickly. As a second question, if you'd rather have that one, um, is there a role for UK midwives to support advocacy eff efforts in Bangladesh for midwifery? Um, uh, I'll <laughs> answer the first one very briefly, and I'll leave Sangeeta to answer the second one. I think um, yes, I, I, there is a the Embrace report uh, is the report in the UK that talks about the differences. in outcomes uh, i think all i can do is is to refer colleagues to that uh, report because the the reasons why people die uh, are are very complex uh, but there are certainly things that we need to do about it and i think there's been a lot of research and what we need now is action sangeeta can you answer the second question about how uk midwives could support advocacy in bangladesh Yeah, already uh, they have supported us. Uh, like we have, we are working with the five, six UK volunteers from the RCM, and they are helping the midwives in advocacy and the uh, leadership, all as well as uh, uh, they give help uh, the midwives to grow uh, the. education sector and uh, education platform yeah and uh, you can uh, join with us uh, uh, through the our society bangladesh midwife free society yes. and our, our royal college of midwives and already uk volunteer helping us and that's how you also uh, all uh, uk volunteers can uh, connected with us thank you so much uh, final thank you to joy and sangeeta for an absolutely fascinating presentation Uh, moving speedily on to our final presentation, I'd like to uh, welcome Michael, mm, a clinical fellow in neurology at Eurolink, uh, University of Chittagong Hospital, Lusaka in Zambia, who will be presenting with Dr. Komba, also I think from the uh, teaching hospital in Zambia. Um, in the interest of time, I will go straight to you, T. Thank you so much. Great, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I'm just waiting for the slides to load. So my name is Mike. I'm one of the urology fellows at Exeter Hospital. 
and I've been working with Euralink, which is a section of the British Association of Urological Surgeons. I'm joined by Dr. Comba, who's a, a urology trainee in the University Teaching Hospital of Zambia based in Lusaka. Uh, my co-authors are also Mr. Nicholas Campaign, who's a urology consultant in Exeter, and Dr. Victor Mapalanga, who's a urology consultant in UTH Zambia. So in terms of a bit of background, so Euralink is a section of BAUS um, and it supports low middle income countries and has established health partnerships in Uganda, Ethiopia, Malawi, Tanzania and Zambia. Its key aims are to support centres for education, development and training, uh, in addition to running educational courses. Um, some of Euralink's work includes training workshops, boot camps, establishing membership examinations and supporting with this in addition to Link Centre mentorship at both a, both a junior and senior level. In addition to this, it's responsible for kind of fundraising and support of equipment for all of these Link Centres uh, and regularly participate in overseas and exchange visits. In terms of the impact of the pandemic on Euralink, um, travel restrictions limited our activity. Uh, and so there was a temporary suspension of Euralink visits and workshops. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mike. I will do I don't know if you're getting me. Am I clear? Thank you. Um, so I'll do the next part, which is basically the impact of the pandemic at UTH Zambia. So the, basically the impact has been, one, the outpatient clinics have been cancelled, uh, mainly because of the pandemic. We've had to do a lot of scaling down and in some cases, cancel certain clinics. Then also the second thing has been that uh, many of our theatre cases have been suspended. So currently we are doing mostly emergencies and very few electives. Uh, the third one is that our medical and surgical beds have been turned into COVID-19 uh, wards, basically because of reduced bed space. This has been mainly because the, especially with the third wave that we have just had, most of the general surgical and medical medical wards have had to be turned into COVID wards uh, due to issues of space. Then the fourth one has been healthcare provision. As a result of the pandemic itself, a lot of funds have been channeled towards acute care for COVID patients. This includes even oxygen, which has increased. Uh, the demand for oxygen has actually gone up because of the pandemic. So basically, from our side as uh, Zambia, uh, especially from the UTH point of view, I think this has been basically the impact of the pandemic. So in the absence of these face-to-face -face visits, um, UTH Zambia previously demonstrated some interest in online learning uh, and learning in the absence of visits. And so it was the perfect opportunity to establish um, an online webinar program. Um, so what our objectives were, well, we tried to cover the urology curriculum and we wanted to make sure that this was relevant to both Zambia and the UK. We did this by reviewing common guidelines and management and we wanted to facilitate access for link centres in the absence of visits. With this comes the consideration of how cases may present or be managed differently um, and how different healthcare environments may respond or manage patients differently. And this provided a perfect opportunity for reciprocal exchange. And we've already heard a bit about bidirectional bi learning. Um, and what we mean by this is kind of reciprocal exchange of knowledge learning from shared experiences and differences in delivery and improving our understanding of each other's healthcare systems. And the feeling was that this would be, you know, the perfect opportunity to do this with benefits extending to um, learning about each other for future visits um, and improving these. So the format was a case-based discussion. Um, we found that using a host was important to ensure that IT ran smoothly. We had a moderator, which was typically a consultant with subspecialty interest and presenters consisting of a UK and Zambia trainee. We had two case presentations, typically a short case, followed by guidelines, uh, management and uh, kind of almost to an exam level. And we had discussion following each case just to highlight the differences. And this was all implemented using the Zoom platform. Um, we recorded each session and uploaded it to the BAUS website and this provided an online resource as well, um, which can, is a permanent resource which can be accessed so those who couldn't attend were able to access the slides and video afterwards. Um, we found that by producing user guides, we found that we were able to 
generate a more consistent format and ensure that each session had a set format and ran smoothly. Um, so we were able to develop 10 sessions over the course of from October to July, uh, running a, a pilot session back in October. Um, and we initially limited numbers just to ensure a suitable training environment and ensure it was sustainable. And then gradually we found that attendance was uh, increased and sustained throughout the period. In terms of the educational benefits, um, we reviewed common guidelines and presentations relevant to the urology curriculum, um, which is also relevant for exams. We found actually that by broadening exposure, we were able to discuss more complex advanced presentations and also cases which some urology trainees in the UK and also in Zambia are not necessarily exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis. We were able to discuss uh, in a closed environment um, and also discuss in detail comparing differences and we found that the education wasn't just limited to the trainees, in fact, moderators as well found that by discussing the differences with healthcare delivery and how they may adapt care, um, they were able to learn from this as well. There was also the thinking outside the box element, which is um, by establishing how cases may be managed differently. For example, we talked about rather than interventional drains, um, using kind of open techniques to place drains. Uh, for nephrostomies in particular, which is draining the kidney in the setting of infection. And then we've all also mentioned the online educational resource, which um, is highlighted here. So all of the videos are online and available to watch. Um, we found that bi-directional learning was key uh, as a result of trainee collaboration. And that was both at a trainee and senior level. So I'll now hand over to Dr. Comber who talk a bit about the local benefits. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Mike. Yeah, so from our side, uh, Zambia, there were a lot of uh, benefits from the collaboration between the UK and the Zambian team. Uh, the first one was, of course, increased knowledge of conditions and case discussion, uh, helping to bridge the knowledge gap. So basically we would have consultants on each side from the Zambian team and from the UK team. And we're able to exchange ideas, uh, taking into consideration also resources and other constraints. Then the third one, the second one was improvements in knowledge uh, in management by comparing the way patients are currently managed to relevant treatment guidelines and adapting care accordingly. So when a case was presented, we're able to look at how best we could manage that case, looking at the resources, as well as by looking at what the guidelines would say. Then uh, the other thing also that it helped us was to review the up-to-date uh, guidelines and evidence for each condition. We're able to look at the guidelines and also to look at what is the evidence base for how those conditions could be best managed. There was also the input from the subspecialist subspecialty moderation and the exposure of the local trainees into specialist management. So this was beyond the general urology exposure. This also resulted in increased confidence because most of the trainees, especially the junior trainees, the first year, second year postgraduate, were able to have bigger, conf greater confidence, sorry, because they were able to have a mentorship through that process of how to prepare cases, how to present cases. So there was a lot of confidence from the trainees. Can okay, move on to the next one. Yes, so we, of course, the one we did was the initial phase. It was the pilot, it was exciting. So we're moving on to phase two, which is starting at the end of this month. So in phase two, we have made certain adjustments or proposed certain adjustments. The first one is that we have a webinar uh, for 2021, 2022, which is phase two, we'll have more centers within Zambia. So the initial phase was just with the UTH. So we are going to in, in, increase the number of centers to four within Zambia. And we are also going to add the center in Malawi, which will bring a total of five centers from, uh, from this side. Then we're also going to expand on the topics because there's been a lot of feedback and excitement with the first phase. So we'd want to increase the topics, bring a more diversity within the topics to improve the learning outcomes. It has also created opportunities for research on both sides, because I think 
there has been interest from that side, especially by looking at the conditions that are more common this side, which may be rare that side and vice versa. And a lot of findings that have come in the research have also, in the presentations, have also created opportunities for research, which could be a, a, an area for future collaboration. Then the lastly, it, there is also a potential, of course, with the COVID situation coming down, we hope that there will be a potential for future exchange visits between the UK and the Zambian team, where we could probably have a hands-on kind of uh, exposure. So this has been our experience, and I think this is our aim going forward for phase two. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Comba. Um, so in summary, um, we were able to adapt to change during the coronavirus pandemic by providing ongoing support, and this was through the means of these webinars. Um, the bidirectional learning was one of the big benefits from this, um, enhancing learning at both the senior and trainee level. Um, and we're, we're able to get a better understanding of how UTH works as a result of this as well. Um, we've also found that it's actually quite a good platform for training engagement with global urology. So it can be often quite difficult to engage with global urology, you know, um, rather than just kind of, um, joining with visits, but um, it can provide a means to engage with global urology even before these visits and establish a bit of a rapport that we've mentioned previously. And we hope that a further webinar programme moving into next year will aim to build on these achievements um, by involving further centres, promoting further collaboration and hopefully some interregional um, um, kind of communication um, and teaching possibly. Um, so I'd just like to conclude everything by just saying a big thank you to our collaborators. Um, it was quite a huge project really involving a lot of people who've given up their own time um, to be involved with the project. And um, without the support of Eurolink, um, it wouldn't be possible. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you so much, um, both to Mike and Dr. Combe. That was absolutely fascinating. Really, really great to hear about the work. Um, I think we've probably got time for one question. Um, so to either of you, what were the challenges and opportunities of delivering this remote training um, on urological care and will you continue this uh, delivery model when visits can resume? Uh, yes, I'm happy to answer. So I think one of the key challenges was that of internet connectivity, um, as expected. So what we found was, um, well, we found that by testing connection beforehand, we also explored the um, option of pre-recording presentations, um, but actually we didn't actually need to do that in the end. So we just did a trial run before each session in terms of the other challenges, well, it required a bit of time. So I, I was fortunate enough that I had some research time over the past year. Um, and also Dr. Combo was happy to give up his time to organize this as well. Um, so I think that's one of the main challenges to make it sustainable really is, is finding people who are able to give up their time. Um, there, is an, there is an appetite for it. Um, and certainly we're looking towards moving towards more of a trainee collaborative moving into phase two. So each trainee is going to take on a different session and um, the hope is that that will allow it to be more sustainable and we're certainly quite keen to continue these um, because they certainly have a role in addition to the exchange visits up here. Thank you so much uh, Mike and thank thank both of you for that super presentation. Um, we have two minutes left which um, is just really enough time for me to thank all our presenters today, particularly for keeping to time and making me look like a competent chair, very grateful for that. Um, so thank you so much to Dr. Grace Drew Drury, uh, Dr. Timothy Nunn, Dr. Sophie Foote, uh, uh, Joy Kemp and Sanjita for talking to us about Bangladesh, uh, and Mike and Dr. Combe who've just presented last. Um, if any of the audience has any further questions um, or comments, then we can ensure that these are these are passed to the to the presenters um uh, but it's been an absolutely absolutely wonderful session if anybody has any last comments from from our panelists or speakers um i think we have one minute um otherwise we can we can move into the to the break um at this stage is that right amy seeing if we've got any more questions. Hiya, sorry, yes, that's absolutely great. I think we've had some amazing questions so far. 
So if we're all happy for, for a one minute early break, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. See you all soon.